Awesome. So we're here to talk about life cycles with birds. It's a really great time of year to start thinking about that. I've been noticing out my window just so much more bird song lately, and it's making me so excited for spring. So most of you are probably pretty familiar with Zoom, but if you aren't, I would just want to take a second. All between all my sharing screen and stopping sharing screen, it probably went full screen for you, and I'm actually going to recommend that you exit full screen. You see that up at the top bar where it says options. That's going to allow you to dock the chat window to the side. The next thing you'll want to do is find the speech bubble icon that says chat. Click on that, and that should open up a chat window for you. And over here where you see right above where you'll write, you should see the opportunity to change from all panelists and attendees um, or to everyone so that everybody can see what we're discussing together. <laughs> all right, so presenting to you as part of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. My name is Kelly Schaefer, and I'm the outreach coordinator with the K-12 education team. And I'm joined tonight by Susan Liker, or excuse me, Susan Licker in our chat window, who's gonna be sharing a bunch of links and, <clears throat> excuse me, and answering questions for you. So please feel free to use the chat window. And our mission with the K-12 education team is to create innovative resources and deliver transformative trainings that empower educators and families to build young people's science skills while inspiring them to connect to nature, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. My goals for this webinar are a little bit ambitious. I wanna cover a lot of ground. I wanna get into some uh, nesting myths, facts, and fiction. I wanna talk a little bit about the citizen science project Nest Watch and how to participate in that. We're also going to learn about the nesting cycle using some slides and resources from a free nest watch curricula. And we're also going to discuss some ways that we can check nests safely because nest watch encourages us to observe wild bird nests. So we want to make sure we're doing that in a way that's safe for us and the birds. So let's take a second to pause and define what citizen science is. So feel free to, in the chat window, go ahead and share some maybe key words or even projects you've worked on if you have a working definition of citizen science. What do you think of when you hear the term citizen science? I'm seeing collaborative. Yes, absolutely. It's active science that anyone can do. Everyone pitches in. Science observed in the communities around us. Absolutely. Everyday folks collecting data, ordinary people that collect data in their area and send to scientists. I'm seeing some projects like Feeder Watch, eBird, Coco Ross. Uh huh. Yeah, awesome. Collecting data without special skills or equipment. I like that as well. It's so, it's been so fun to me. I've been with the lab for a little over five years now. And the answer I get when I ask that question now versus when I started is so different. I really feel like citizen science is on people's mind and that makes me so happy. You all have so many um, of the important pieces and part of what citizen science is and what makes it special. It is absolutely people powered science. It's regular folks like you, me and our students who aren't professional scientists. We can go out, we can make observations of the natural world and we can share those observations into databases that scientists can then use to answer real world questions. 
So that is a really exciting way to get kids interested in citizens, or excuse me, in doing science because they know that their data matters. And I like this picture. It makes me think of we're putting together like these puzzle pieces of the world. So projects in which folks volunteer, share their observations with scientists and answer real world questions. For us as educators, it's a really useful tool because it gets kids outside. It captures that natural curiosity they have. When you take kids outside, you probably notice all of the questions that arise. And when we're participating in citizen science, we're using science practices. And so this really helps meet a lot of our STEM content and science practice standards, um, particularly thinking about like the NGSS science practices. It helps our students connect to local wildlife and build a sense of place, which can lead to environmental stewardship. It also provides us with access to real life data, which is a really cool way to explore uh, some of these powerful databases that we are helping support. Plus, it's fun. It can be really exciting to get outside and watch birds or observe nature in ways that you haven't done before. As I mentioned, it answers that essential question of why are we doing this? Because your data really do matter. So let's talk about NestWatch. NestWatch is one of several citizen science projects run through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, it's a really fun project that gives you a really intimate look into the life of birds because you are out there finding and observing nests. It is a long time commitment. So we have some citizen science projects like eBird where you just watch birds for five minutes and submit that list and then you've participated. Um, nest watch, you know, the most useful data to us is when we can get the whole lifetime of a nest and that can take uh, you know, a month. So um, repeated visits to the same site over and over. It is a little bit more of a time commitment, but I think what you get out of this is this really rich experience with uh, viewing the life cycle of birds in action. And you can see right here on the front page is kind of this how to participate section that tells us the basic steps of participating in Nest Watch. So the first thing you need to do is get certified. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's a pretty simple online guide to how to safely monitor nests. Then you take a quiz, you get certified, you know that you're gonna be out there um, and you're not gonna endanger yourself or the birds. Step two is finding nests. Step three is recording data. And then step four is submitting that data online or with the mobile app, which is a free app. So what does this data look like? Where does it go? This is a snapshot of the map page on nestwatch.org. And it will show you that we've got over 118,000 nest sites recorded in the Nestwatch database. You can see that the vast majority of them are in North America, specifically in uh, the United States but we have been expanding globally. We do focus North America on the resources we provide on the Nest Watch site. Um, so there's a lot of really re rich resources for you about um, how to find and identify nests. So let's dive right into some of that nesting bird fact or fiction. Um, I would love for you to participate in this. Go ahead and put your thoughts and your answers into the chat window as we go through. When I do this with kids, if um, I'm in person, I like to have a side of the room that's true and a side of the room that's false and start the kids in the middle and then have them run to one side or the other. Another thing I like to do is ask the kids to share their reasoning. So why did you choose the answer that you chose? And then based on what their peers say, give everyone an opportunity to change their mind. Let's go ahead and look at number one, all birds build nests. Do you think that is true or false? Go ahead and share your thoughts in the chat window.
I'm seeing a range of falses to enthusiastic falses. <laughs> and some people saying, hmm, well, what do you mean by build a nest? So we might be thinking of some birds scrape nests on the ground. Does that count? Anybody want to share their reasoning why they chose the response they chose? Georgia's thinking about a fairy turn which just lays their egg on a bare branch. Maureen's pointing out that some birds use other birds' nests. Great, yeah. So in North America, our um, cowbirds are obligate brood parasites. So they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds. Carol's pointing out that some birds take over other bird nests, like owls using um, old hawk nests, for example. Awesome. Yeah, you guys are really up on your bird biology. I love it. Um, an example that kids will often come up with is penguins um, because they hold their eggs on their feet. Well, certain species anyway. <laughs> All right, let's look at number two. Some birds give birth to live babies rather than eggs. True or false? Seeing lots of falses roll in again. Yeah, this is one of the defining characteristics of birds, right? Birds lay hard shelled eggs. So this can be kind of a, a useful way to gauge what your students know about birds already. I like this question because of that. All right, let's skip down to number four. Most baby birds are fed seeds and berries by their parents. What do you think, true or false? Okay, seeing mostly false, a couple possibly trues. Just a quick reminder to make sure that you're sending if you're comfortable, all your responses to all panelists and attendees or to everyone might be your option. Yeah, so actually I'm seeing a lot of fossils. So, and Dudley saying many feed insects. Yes, so there's a lot of birds out there who actually will switch their diet from seeds, majority seeds to feeding their young insects, right? Because young birds need a lot of protein because they are growing. So we've got things like um, bugs and insects going to songbirds. We've got things like fish and small mammals going to raptors. Um, so there's a lot of protein happening when we're feeding um, young. There, there's only one bird, I think, or a very few birds in North America that could be considered truly vegetarian. And uh, goldfinches are among them. And that's because they, they, you'll notice that they wait till later in the season to start breeding because they're waiting for the seeds to be available. So they start breeding just a little later in the season than everyone else because they do feed their young seed. All right. Let's look at number six. Only the female mother bird sits on eggs. Ooh, lots of falses run, running through. You'll notice that this is a very specifically worded question, right? Because previously, um, We've had a similar question where we, uh, we asked all bird species lay eggs and uh, kids would ask, say, oh, but wait, or all birds lay eggs and kids would say, but wait, no, males don't lay eggs. So we have to be very specific because <laughs> kids will find little loopholes and I love it. All right, so yes, in this case, uh, it's gonna vary a lot by species, right? So 
some species like certain or most hummingbirds, only the female tends the nest, builds and raises the young. Um, other species, the males are highly involved. And there's even a few species out there where the female's really not that involved at all. I'm thinking about like a bird like a jacana. All right, so that's just a fun way that you can kind of get at some of these things and uncover some things that your students know already and what they don't know, provides you with an opportunity to talk about evidence and um, listening to others and changing your mind, depending on how you run the activity. So let's dive into some, ooh, forgot I got fun colors. <clears throat> let's dive into, oh, somebody's asking about number five. Birds can breed inside their eggs before they hatch. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, so eggshells are semi-permeable mem membranes. Um, so air passes through them. And at a certain point, the bird's lungs are developed enough that they're breathing through inside their eggshell. So one way to think about it is a bird's first breath, the one they take when they break out of the eggshell. All right. So let's dive into this curriculum. This is Thinking Outside the Nest Box. It is written for fifth through eighth grade students, but um, could be adapted. And it is available for free on our website. And it gives you a really awesome opportunity to dive into the Nest Watch Citizen Science Project with your students. So the slides I'm going to share you are derived with you now are derived from uh, these lessons. So first, one of the things that this this lesson does is it encourages you to build nest boxes. So let's dive into a little bit why nest boxes. Well, from a bird's perspective, a nest box is essentially a tree cavity. So there's lots of birds out there that are cavity nesters. And it turns out that cavities are a pretty limiting factor in whether or not birds are able to breed in a lot of instances, because you have to have enough cavities for the birds and they can be a source of competition. And it has a lot to do with how we as people have modified the landscape. In a lot of ways, we have um, taken down things like snags and um, dead trees, dead wood. We take them out of our forests typically because we're worried about them falling. We take them out of our yards. And that's typically where you find these cavities that birds nest in. So a way that we can support our cavity nesting birds is by putting out nest boxes. So that's kind of how we think about nest boxes is we're helping to supplement the shortage of tree cavities. Now let's talk a little bit about what makes a good nest box. We've got our good example on the left and our bad on the right. So one of the things you want to do is minimize opportunities for predators to access the next nest box. Um, so you'll see things like an entrance hole that is the size for the bird that you want to attract. That is a key one because you want the entrance hole to be limiting. You want one hole, you don't want three holes like you see on the other nest box. Um, and you want, if you're putting it on a pole, putting a predator guard on there is a really great thing to do as well. Typically you want untreated wood and you want a slope roof and you want drain holes. And all of this helps um, protect the bird from weather and also um, it's healthier for the birds to have untreated wood. You also wanna make sure that you have a door that opens this will allow you to clean out the nest between seasons um, and that can help reduce things like uh, parasite buildup and things like that. But also there are a lot of birds out there who want a clean nest box before they will build a nest in it. So this curricula starts to dive into habitats because habitat is a really important consideration for the <laughs> excuse me, for the type of birds that you will see nesting around you. So here we see a series of different habitats. Um, we've got woodlands, open woodlands, we've got wetlands, lakes, forests, town, cities, or shrub forests. 
And this, the lessons in this activity kind of guide you through some of the characteristics of these habitats and then challenge you to match the bird to the habitat. So for example, if we look at the wood ducks in the upper right hand corner, we can guess that these are gonna belong near a wetland. Now wood ducks are a little tricky because as I mentioned, they are cavity nesters, uh, or excuse me, I didn't mention that, but they are cavity nesters and they nest in trees. So that can be a little surprising for people. We like to think of ducks or we typically think of ducks as nesting on the ground. Then we have other birds like our robin and cardinal and tree swallow who are gonna be a little bit more adaptable and nest in more locations. And so you can go through this activity, you can have your students do their best to look at the bird, ponder about where, if they've seen it before, where they've seen it and where they think it might nest, and then challenge them to do some research, find out, what the habitat and nesting needs are of these birds. And NestWatch has a really wonderful resource for you to take advantage of. This is the Common Nesting Birds Interactive on the NestWatch website. So you can go in there, you can select what area you're in, you can select what habitat you're in and look at birds, or you can just kind of scroll through these really common birds that you can see here and see, uh, learn about their nesting needs. What's really great about this is this, if you find a nest and you're trying to figure out who built it, you can go to nest type and select the type of nest. So if you find a cup nest and you're not sure who built it in your bush, you can use this tool to help you figure it out. Now the next part of this curriculum starts to dive into the nesting cycle. We have it broken down into six major steps. So let's see if we can figure out what those steps are together. What do you think the first step of the nesting cycle would be? What if I told you it starts even before courtship? So yeah, we're thinking the first thing a male does after he migrates is yes, Deborah's got it. He finds a territory. <clears throat> so typically, the typical kind of, <laughs> Julia says peacocking, yeah. So typically a male is going to find a defended territory, and that can look like a number of different things. We'll dive into that in a little bit more depth. Um, and that is kind of a key part of finding and attracting a mate. So we've got finding and defending a territory. Our male's got his spot. He's ready. What do you think the next step is? Find a mate, absolutely. Attract a mate. That might look different for a lot of different birds. All right, so our male has done his peacocking. He's found his territory. He showed off enough. He's attracted a mate. Um, what would be the next fifth grade appropriate step in the mating cycle? Find or build a nest. Yeah, so we've kind of combined a couple steps here, but I can see that you all are right on track. Building a nest or finding a nest and laying eggs. All right, let's look at <clears throat> step number four. We've got our nest, we've laid our eggs. What would step number four be? There's a question about what percentage of birds mate for life. That's a really good question, uh, Marianne. I don't have an answer for you. Um, and mating for life can be, 
an interesting concept in birds. Um, often what we're talking about is actually social parenting. So we'll have birds that we say mate for life, for example, cardinals perhaps. And what will happen is that, or they'll, they'll tend to be monogamous at least for a season, but they will often actually sneak copulations outside of their social partner because uh, the benefits of genetic diversity in a brood. <clears throat> but there are definitely birds out there that uh, tend to we, to, we tend to say mate for life, things like cranes come to mind. Um, and again, that would be, you know, mating for life until one of the partners dies and then another bond might be formed. All right, so step number four is incubating eggs. Absolutely, yes. So this can take a long time, right? For typical songbird size, we're looking at about 14 days, about two weeks of incubation period. This is gonna vary a lot um, on the type of bird. Raptors, for example, larger birds are gonna be a larger, longer period of time. All right, so they're in incubating our eggs. Sometimes we have males and females, depending on the species, switching this duty. What comes after incubating those eggs? Yes, absolutely. Feed and feed and feed and feed those nestlings, those hungry, hungry nestlings. Absolutely. All right, so we've done all this hard work. We fed and raised our nestlings. What do you think the final step of this nesting cycle is? Fledging, yes, kick those babies out of the nest. It's time to learn to fly, fledging. So this is what, this last step here is what it takes to be considered a successful nest when it comes to Project Nest Watch and to really any study on bird reproduction. This final step is do any young fledge from the nest. Of course, there, there could be varying levels of success there. So let's dive into defend, finding and defending a territory a little bit. Um, Georgia, I see your question about mates and um, remind, poke me again at the end and we can talk about that a little bit. So finding and defending a territory, this is something that nearly all birds do during the breeding season. Um, it means having enough resources to not only uh, feed themselves, but also raise babies who have really high demands for nutrition and energy because they're growing. So um, breeding territory can be incredibly important. Um, in the case of individuals in breeding colonies, these territories might be very, very small, but you still, you'll see like in communal nesting areas, you'll see jostling for these little tiny sites that are their space. Um, so there's even a premium in, in colonial situations like this. The red-winged blackbird that we have pictured here is a really great example to think about nesting territory because they have a pretty cool nesting system. One male may nest with many females. So it really depends on the quality of his territory. So the better his territory, the more likely he is to have several mates. Uh, a male with poorer territory might have one, might have none. And then you'll even have males whose strategy is not to hold a ter territory at all, but kind of sneak around and, and uh, you know, be the, be the side can I say side chick? Is that, <laughs> but, uh, you know, kind of sneak in and mate in, in that way. <clears throat> so this territory piece can be a really important part of finding a mate, but there's a lot of other things that go into it. Typically it's the males who are trying to impress the females in the world of birds. Uh, this can involve anything from the color of the plumage to um, how vigorous and often they are able to sing to their aerial displays. Um, some males, it even comes down to, are you really good at picking out where to put a nest? Um, can you build an attractive nest? Um, 
and there's there's might be courtship rituals that involve like feeding your mate and things like that so building a relationship in that way the next step, building a nest. Birds use just an incredible variety of materials in their nests. Lots of natural materials, of course, twigs, sticks, dead leaves, pebbles, mud, hair, fur, and feathers. But you might often see uh, products from people incorporated into nests. So you might see things like plastic or string that birds will pick up um, and, and use a nest. I've studied wood thrush and often they would pick up um, plastic and kind of lay it on the bottom foundation of their nests. And I think it's because it really resembled the very papery birch leaves that they typically use down there. So um, you'll find all different sorts of materials in nests. And the materials that birds tend to choose tend to be um, common among the species. So for example, chickadees are known for using moss in their nests. So if you see a really mossy nest in a nest box, you might be able to surmise chickadee, depending on where you are. Deborah's saying that some birds use snakeskin. Yes, absolutely. I've had an, a startling encounter with a tufted titmouse who use snakeskin in their nest. They're cavity nesters and it was in a little snag only like four and a half feet off the ground. And I went to pull out this little piece of sna snake skin that was in the snag because I wanted to look at it and something hissed at me. <laughs> and of course I assumed it was the snake, but I peeked in the hole and it was a titmouse on, on its nest. So it did a very good job of making me think it was a snake. Birds often also will build all sorts of different kinds of nests. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to east to each sort. Um, so we'll see scrape nests for eggs um, that are, you know, and you'll see on these eggs are typically really patterned, so they camouflage in well. We've got platform nests, things like osprey, dome nests, things like oven birds. Um, we'll build a dome nest. It's one of the ways they got their name. Pendant nests, like we see from this oriole, that um, hang from tree branches. Cup nests, something like a robin might build, very typical nest shape that you see. And then the cavity nests we've been talking about. Laying eggs is a really demanding part of the nesting cycles for our female birds. Um, the term for a set of eggs laid at one nesting attempt by a female is called a clutch. And usually a clutch of eggs for a songbird is gonna be four to five eggs for something like robin sized. Um, bluebirds often will have five in their first nesting. Um, the next nesting, they often will have less than the maximum. So they, if they do another nesting attempt, they might have four, or if they started with four, they might have three, just because of these energetic costs that go into creating um, these eggs. The laying time is gonna vary a lot between species, but typically for songbirds, we're looking at one egg a day, and then they will start incubation on the penultimate egg. So the second to last egg that they lay, they'll start incubating them. So incubation of the eggs is a really important part of development for the chicks. They need to be kept at a pretty common, or excuse me, pretty level temperatures. And so incubation might mean keeping eggs warm. It might also mean keeping eggs cool. So on a hot summer day, you might see an adult crouched over the nest, not sitting on the eggs, but providing them shade. So um, it really requires parents to be very attentive. So females will actually develop something called a brood patch um, where they lose the feathers on their belly so that they have um, bare skin that's really vascular. So it has lots of um, veins and also they'll build up some fluid there that helps transfer heat from their bodies to the egg. This is called a brood patch. And when an adult bird sits on their eggs to warm them, this is called brooding. All right, when the chicks hatch, they use a little egg tooth. You can see it in this picture here um, on this hawk. Um, they use that to kind of break through and wear away at the egg. 
this process can take a long time and it's called pipping. So um, I don't know if you watch any bird cams, but you'll often see lots of excitement on the first day that a chick can be seen pipping or breaking through the eggshell. So when it comes to hatchlings, there are a couple different types that you might run into. Precocial hatchlings are those that are independent and feathered. So think like ducklings or um, chickens would have precocial hatchlings as well. Altricial hatchlings are those that are really dependent on their parents. So they're the pink squirmy, um, somewhat alien-esque looking chicks that you'll um, see in a robin's nest. Their eyes are closed, they're pretty helpless. They need a lot of time to develop in the nest before they are ready to fledge. Feeding and raising young can look different for different birds, the food sources that they use, how long um, they feed they, their young, whether it's in the nest or if they're precocial young, if they are you know, taking them straight out into the water and teaching them how to eat. Um, this is a, another lengthy period in the nesting process. Typically from hatching in your normal songbird, you're looking at another two weeks. Um, other bird species might be longer. When it comes to fledging, again, this is gonna vary a lot by species, um, but fledging is defined as when the young are able to leave the nest, they're not necessarily, however, fully capable of flight. Um, they, they do have their first complete set of flight feathers. So their wing feathers and their tail feathers. Um, their tails might be quite short at this point, however. Um, and this is a term that we usually apply just to those altricial nestlings, so those ones who start out helpless and spend time in the nest. Um, this is kind of what I like to think of as the awkward teenage phase in birds. So they're, the fledglings are just kind of hopping around. They're not flying great. If you see them, you might think, oh gosh, this poor bird has been abandoned and it's not gonna survive. I better take it somewhere to get help. Typically that's not actually the case. The parents are usually nearby. They're still feeding the young. Um, the only time that you really wanna interfere with or move a fledgling is if it's in immediate danger. For example, there's a car coming or there's a feral cat or something like that. All right, so now we have kind of an overview of the nesting cycle. We know some of the biology that we're dealing with and the terminology that we're dealing with. I wanna talk a little bit about getting certified to be a nest watcher. Talk several times about there being a little quiz on the certification process to make sure that you can minimize the risk of accidental harm to nests or and not risk any harm to yourself as well. Uh, one of the things we have to be really conscious of when we are watching nests is that we can lead predators to nests. So we want to be aware of that. So things that we might, uh, you'll learn to do in this certification process is to, you know, vary how you approach the nest. You don't want to approach the nest from one angle and leave out the same way and basically create a dead end trail that goes to the nest box because Predators are smart, they'll follow your scent, they'll learn that, hey, you're stopping here for a reason. And they can pick up on the fact that this dead end trail is a good indication that there's a nest there. Um, and there have been you know, instances of predators learning that they can follow somebody's trail to a series of nest boxes. So you approach from one side, leave from the other, the next day you switch it up kind of thing. So those are the sorts of tips and tricks that you will learn through the certification process. One of the things I want you to be aware of is the time commitment that it takes to participate in Nest Watch. There are a longer period of time that you need to commit to these data points um, where you're looking at observing the nest every three to four days. We don't want to go every day because um, we want to minimize our interruptions, but three to four days is kind of the sweet spot we're looking for. Most successful songbird nests are gonna last for about a month. Um, you're gonna need to visit then seven to 10 times. Um, the visits should be short, right? So you wanna go in up to the nest, look at the nest, observe what you need to observe, and then walk away and then take down the data. So 
We want to minimize our time at the nest no longer than a minute. Some tips for making sure that you don't uh, unduly disturb the birds are that uh, you don't want to check early in the morning or late in the evening. So most birds are going to lay their eggs in the early morning. So typically after 10 a.m. is a great time to start checking nests. Um, typically before 10 a.m. is when a bird will lay their eggs. Birds also are gonna stay on their nest at night. So you don't wanna scare them off in the late evening and risk that it will get too dark before they can come back. Um, obviously there are gonna be exceptions to these rules for things like nocturnal animals like owls. You also wanna avoid the nest during some kind of sensitive times. So if you see a bird building a nest, you don't want to hang around while they're building a nest because they haven't invested much time or energy into that nest yet. They're going to, if they feel like you are creeping on them, they're going to abandon it. So that's one stage. Um, another stage here is avoiding early incubation because it can be really upsetting to be disturbed in those first couple of days. So you're going to have to, you know, pay attention to the timing once you kind of get a sense for what's going on with the nest. And Nest Watch will guide you through some of that. Part of that is learning to observe nests from a bit of a distance. So approach only really when you, the female leaves, if you can. So if you have a pair of binoculars and you can kind of peek and see what's going on, it's great if you can time it for when the female has already left. And then this is a harder one. You need to be aware of the timing of the nest. You don't want to approach it when the young are close to fledging. They will spook. They have a kind of predator response to where if they're disturbed and they're like close to fledging, they're going to go for it because, uh, you know, evolutionarily speaking, that's the better strategy. Um, you know, if you abandon ship because a raccoon is there, you're less likely to get eaten. They don't can't really tell the difference between us and a predator. They will not go back. If they fledge early, they will not go back in the nest. They just won't. Um, you can try, but they won't. <laughs> and of course, we want to avoid nests during bad weather. Um, you don't want to scare a female off on a cold, rainy day and then have the eggs or the young exposed to that weather. And as I mentioned before, you gotta think about the tracks that you're leaving to the nest. You wanna avoid making dead end trails. And we wanna do our best to observe if the adult is on the nest, if we can wait for it to leave on its own, that's great. If not, then we can check the nest. Um, and then if the bird flushes, you wanna give it a little time to get away. So flushes means flying off the nest. You wanna give it a little time to, to get away before you come approach it. Another thing that I will do is when I'm checking nests and I can't see inside of it, and I don't, I think the female's not there, but I'm not sure, is I knock before I open because if she's there, she'll pop off. Um, and then you can not have a mutual heart attack when you open the door. But for the most part, you don't want to force a bird off if you can at all help it. If they're, if you go to check a nest and the female's sitting really tight on the nest, there's probably a reason. So um, just back off, give her a little time if you have that time and then record your visit. Um, sometimes this might mean missing a visit and that's okay too. So there's a myth that if a female bird, a mother bird, parent bird smells your scent on an egg or a chick, they will abandon it. That's not true, but we still want to minimize the amount that we are handling eggs or young birds. Um, so eggs and nestlings are, are fragile. We just want to minimize any kind of physical handling of them. And it is important to note that it's actually against the law to, in many cases, own nests or feathers or things like that from migratory birds. All right, so how do we go about finding and monitoring nests? 
Nest boxes are a great approach because you know where a nest site might be, but you can also pay attention to bird behavior and you can find nests around you. They don't have to be cavity nests. You can find the robin nest, um, nesting above the lights on the playground or a cardinal in a bush. All of these birds count. The barn swallows underneath the um, picnic table shelter, like those all count. And you can use those birds that you just happen to find the nests for. There are a lot of behavior cues that will help you find them. So birds will often show you the way when it's nest building season. You see a bird carrying some grass in its beak and you know, hey, this bird's acting really nesty. Keep your eye on it, see where it goes. They'll often disappear in kind of the same area over and over again. Take notes on where they go and then move away. Um, and then come back to it a couple days later when they've had the chance to finish building the nest because you don't want to scare them away during this stage. Egg laying is, is probably the hardest time to find a nest. Um, the female, you just have to get lucky. The female's not really going to be on it except for when she's laying eggs and so only once a day. Um, otherwise, she's not going to be on it. She's not going to be drawing attention to it. She's going to be going about her business, eating lots of food and regaining her energy. Incubation is, uh, can be hard too. You'll, you'll see a female bird and then she'll just kind of go poof and be gone. Um, and that's because she's being a little sneaky, but if she goes poof in the same area over and over again, that's a, a good cue to check that area. Um, if males are in that same area singing their little hearts out, that's another great cue. You might also notice that you walk by a bush and a, a bird flies out silently and then all of a sudden starts yelling at you from somewhere else. That is a really good clue that there's a nest there as well that you watched a bird. During the nestling phase, you can hear the nestlings. The parents are super busy. They're taking things from the nest. They're bringing food to the nest. Um, this is a, a much easier time to find nests, really, really active. My only thing to, to flag you for this period of finding nests is that they could be close to fledging. So if you see young, like either of these guys that are like really heavily feathered, you don't want to get super close to the nest because you don't know they could be close to fledging and you just don't want to fledge them early or force fledge them. All right, so whew, that was a really quick overview of some safety tips for checking nests. So say you do all of this, you find some nests, you check nests safely, you record that data and share it. Why? Why does this data matter? What does it do for us? Um, this lesson will go into that. Um, it dives into looking at the data of mountain bluebirds. And so you can start to see that these data sets are really important for looking at long-term averages. So we can kind of get into the fact that we have this baseline for where these birds are. We can start to notice that we have highs and lows. There are good years and bad years. Um, and then this allows us to have this baseline so that if something changes, we're aware. We're aware if a species begins to decline. And so if you are exploring Nest Watch, they have a right bird, right house feature, which will show you um, some of the decline that's happening in birds in your area. So we know from these incredible trends that we get from these citizen science databases that have been gathering data for years, we can start to see decreases in these trends, which alert us to the fact that the species is in decline, which allows us to act um, at a, a much quicker point in time, which provides us with a better opportunity to protect species. And then of course, sharing that data that you collect is really important. Your data really matter when it comes to discovering these long-term trends. So if you collect that data, please do be sure to submit it either online or through the free app, um, that, which will walk you both through, which both will walk you through the process of doing that. Um, there are data sheets that come with this lesson. So if you wanna collect data on paper sheets, you can absolutely do that and make sure that you have everything you need. 
Um, and then you can dig into the data on the Nest Watch website yourself. So there is um, a whole data section. You can download all of the data. You can download your own data. You can look at particular species. So there's all sorts of really cool data discovery things that you can do with students. You can kind of cut them loose and let them explore and ask and answer questions. All right, so that is this resource, Thinking Outside the Nest Box. I know that the education landscape out there, let's say, is still a little unsure. Some folks are remote, some are in person, some are blended. So I did want to just take a second to draw your attention to the science and nature activities for cooped up kids. If you are remote, um, this could be a great resource for you to pick up on. These are grade banded activities, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, that have a lot of independent work and slides. Um, there are Google Slides that kids in the older groups can go through on their own or with some adult help for the K2. And they have lots of fun activities. We have just a, a really big variety of topics, but I want you to draw your attention to activities two through four, courtship and song, nests and eggs, birds growing up. So you could use these for some of this background, um, bird biology, life cycle lessons. So it'll do things like guide you through the nesting cycle like we did. Um, and each one focuses on uh, two of those stages. So lesson two, I believe it was, focuses on the first part and so on. Um, we utilize things like bird cams to get kids making observations and seeing what it's like to be in a bird nest. We also challenge kids to go outside and build a nest um, out of materials there. And if your kids can't go outside, we always provide an indoor alternative. Um, and we also walk kids through uh, a fun egg dissection. So you can see what the pieces and parts of a bird egg are. So there's lots of fun activities in there, um, lots of opportunities for you to uh, pull content and get your kids excited about nesting birds. Uh, the bird cams are also gonna be a great resource for you a really cool way to see what goes on day to day in the nest of birds. So we have a number of bird cams from the lab. Um, I want to say it's allaboutbirds.org slash cams. And you can get kind of this amazing view into what it's like to raise some baby birds. I'm just so distracted by the look of this owl's face. I do feel like I'm intruding a little bit. <laughs> but you can see uh, prey that they've brought back, like this squirrel here. Um, and so it's kind of cool to accompany these nest watch materials with it because when you do nest watch, you know, you're only spending about a minute at a nest. So you want to be as non-invasive as you can. And it's bird cams can kind of fill in the gap on what goes on the day-to-day -day basis. Well, thanks for going on this wild ride with me. We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions about nesting birds or nest watch resources, uh, now is a great time to ask them. I believe we have one question that I said I would talk about at the end. Um, so I believe the question was related to morning doves, um, how you often see them in pairs. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure uh, about... Sorry, I'll put a few in the chat for you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Susan. Um, for When it comes to morning doves, I don't know about their pair bonding specifically, but I would say that... In birds that have strong pair bonds, that yes, the, the loss of a partner can really affect them. Um, I've seen it in captive cranes, for example. There was one particular crane who lost his mate and you know stopped eating and, and didn't start again until he was um, able to court a new mate.
What do you recommend if a house sparrow moves into a bluebird house? Well, it's a toughie. This is a really hard one um, because house sparrows are invasive birds, so they're not protected under the same laws that our native birds are. So it's kind of a personal choice here, whether you're comfortable removing that bird's nest. Some people will capture um, the house sparrow inside the nest and, and kick them out. Um, house sparrows might actually kill bluebirds to steal their nesting location. One way that you can kind of minimize this is to put out multiple boxes. Um, I also often hear recommended putting like a two bluebird boxes back to back. Um, and often what will happen then is you'll get tree swallows in one and bluebirds in the other, and then they kind of co-defend the area. And then if you have another box out there, you might be able to just kind of direct the sparrows there. Um, some people will do what my aunt euphemistically refers to as dispatching the house sparrows. I don't know if I could personally do that. Um, but there are lots of things you can do to try and prevent that. There are like little things you can put on the entrance hole that extends them and makes it kind of like a long tunnel. And the house sparrows do not like that, but it doesn't bother the bluebirds. Um, you can also put like, um, I forget what they're called, but they're like little distracting things, little disruptors that you can put on top of the house that flash and make lights that the sparrows don't like, but don't bother the bluebirds once they're moved in. <clears throat> Maureen's asking if you could take a picture of a nest without being invasive. Yes, absolutely. That is a really fantastic idea. If the nest is a little confusing and there's a jumble of heads and feet and you're not really getting a good count on the birds, I absolutely recommend taking a quick picture um, so that you can, you can check it later. That can actually help you spend less time at the nest and, and that would, that's the most invasive part is you being physically there. How do cave swallows fledge? The nests I see are under bridges and over waters. Great question. Um, so the heart of the answer is I don't know for sure, but I can make some, some inferences based on observations of um, barn swallows and things. So they might stay in the nest a little bit longer. They're probably gonna wait until they're better flyers before they go. Um, you'll see them standing on the rim of the nest and really practicing, building up their muscles. So they might be a bird that when they leave the nest, they're actually better flyers already than other birds. Um, and it's entirely possible that some of them will end up in the water, some of them will end up on the road and won't survive. But there's like a, a cost benefit thing going on here where the benefit of having an inaccessible nest in a cave or under a bridge or over the water where predators really can't get you kind of outweighs the one or two chicks you might lose to uh, the surroundings. Deborah is asking about um, students unexpectedly bringing in bird nests. Where can these be donated that can legally keep them? Great question. Um, I would check with local nature centers. Often they will have salvage permits. So these are our permits that allow them to, um, for example, collect a bird that has hit a window or a nest that's already been used and fallen out of a tree. It allows them to, to give those things a second life. Awesome. Well, I want to encourage everybody, if you if you have questions in the future, please feel free to stay in touch. Um, you can find all of our, our email and our, our social media here. Uh, 